Hello, everyone. Welcome to yet another Friday. This is Deep Learning Classics and Trends. Today we have Krithana here with us. Um, before we get started, she's going to talk about robotics and learning in large scale foundation models, perhaps. Um, before we get started, I want to ask you, Krithana, uh, how did you get into research? And I know that you are from sort of a unique background. Um, so purely by luck, I uh, went, uh, so I've been doing robotics for a bit, but mostly like R&D and development, uh, not really like publishing sort of research. Um, and then I passed a Google interview uh, and matched to the brain robotics team. And that's how I started uh, doing research. Um, so I actually, I'm from India and I have a mechanical engineering degree. Um, and I can quite relate with ML Collective's work on uh, making research more accessible. Like if you're from India, for example, um, the, the research infra and funding is very limited compared to American universities. And uh, it's very hard to, as an undergrad, to like get uh, papers published at like top conferences, like ML conferences in the US. Um, and then uh, the way that PhDs in the US, uh, the admission uh, requirements are, you already need to have papers. Um, so in, in general, like it's like you need to be qualified before you do, uh, you're required to do research. So that makes it, I think, particularly hard for like people from developing countries, I'd say that. And, uh, and I, I can really like empathize with the type of uh, work that ML Collective is doing with like distributed GPUs, the tiny papers, effort, mentoring uh, people. Thank you so much. That was not a prompt for you to say something nice about our collective, but thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's really good to hear um, that you got a chance. And, and I feel like this is a common answer when I ask people, how do you become who you are? And people often attribute it to luck. Although, of course, there's lots of hard work and a lot of like help from colleagues and the chances you get, which is, which hinges on luck. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like you, yeah, I, you have to learn it on the job. And at Google, like I have really great colleagues who like, if you work in a great team, like your strengths are sort of like complementary. Mm -hmm. um, and what I, uh, what I lack other people make up for. And I think together uh, we, we make a great team. Yeah, you, you still have to learn a lot of things. Like what are the most important problems to uh, work on? And I think, especially in research, it's like you can spend a lot of effort in making many mediocre papers, but if you really think about what are the most important problems and write a great paper, it goes a long way in your career. Um, so there are like different trade-offs compared to like how you work in other domains, I think. Yeah, absolutely true. Um, oh, I can't wait to learn more about robotics. I don't do robotics myself, but I'm always fascinated about that line of effort. So let's hear it. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. So the title of my talk is Towards a Robotics Foundation Model. I was making the talk yesterday and I was like, this is what everyone's thinking about in robotics. And um, it is the next North Star for us. Um, and it's very important to um, also reason about what is the most efficient way to go about uh, building very generic intelligence in the physical world. Um, and I want to give a little bit of context. Uh, this was one of our papers from December and it was the robotics transformer. It uh, can do over 700 tasks um, and it was trained on like 130K episodes collected from different robots on around like 17 months. And now the idea is that if it can do 700 tasks, how do we build a model that can do 7,000 or 70,000 tasks in the physical world? Um, next slide. So the agenda of the talk, first we would go over what are the ingredients potentially that could make a robotics foundation model. Then I would give uh, notes on like recent works from our lab that uh, point in that direction and our main takeaways from that. And also uh, towards the end, we can uh, think a little bit about um, now that we have a lot of takeaways, we know what works and what doesn't work. How can we take this forward and try to really accelerate robotic capabilities? So the question is like, why build a foundation model for robotics? Um, I think like with the emergence and popularity of chat GPT, this is a fairly answered question. 
uh, foundation models have a lot of emergent capabilities um, in the sense that once you, they have a lot of complex behavior that is not uh, present in like smaller models. Um, and also they can, one model can do a lot of many different tasks. And some principles uh, that is very common in AI development is that diverse data is very important. And a lot of uh, skills start coming up once you really scale your models. And in robotics, this might actually make the difference between uh, the last decade of robotic deployment and the current decade. In the last decade, we had like specific, uh, specific robots for specific jobs that were deployed in constrained environments. Uh, so think like industrial robotics, uh, think, I think between 2016, between 2015 and 2019, there were a lot of these toy robots and stuff that would do like little games and entertainment and stuff. Um, and the, and what we want today is like more general, more generally intelligent robots that can do a lot of tasks uh, with one model. And this also makes sense from a cost perspective and would lead to widespread adoption of uh, robotics. So like the question is like, how do we scale from like one bin to one room, one building, and maybe to the rest of the world? And uh, yeah, this is a trend in deep learning so far that uh, a lot of different fields have converged into this method of like transformers, scaling with params, scaling with diverse data. And we think that robotics is the next domino. It's a very multimodal problem domain, but I think we are right at the cusp of disrupting uh, robotics as we have known. Like robotics is a problem that has like existed since maybe like what 80 years since like Asimov's book came out. Came out. Um, and we have been thinking about how to build capable robots for a long time, uh, but we really haven't uh, been applying the new developments in, uh, in science like deep learning, GPU acceleration. Um, it's like, you know, Richard Hamming's uh, uh, talk on like uh, how to do your research, uh, you and your research. So one of the key points he mentions is that like a person always like keeps, a good researcher always keeps in the back of their mind, what are the most important problems? And then when a solution to that problem appears, they try to immediately get on that and then apply it. And, and we think that robotics is a very important problem to be solved because um, there are a lot of useful things to do in the physical world. Physical work still contributes to a large percentage of uh, our GDP. And deep learning uh, is a very capable technology that just came about and in the last uh, few years. And we wanna see how much we can surf the wave of deep learning to get, to get really far ahead in accelerating robotics. So now the question becomes like, how do we go about making a robotics foundation model? Like what are the like ingredients for it? So the first idea is design principles of ML scaling. We know that the way that it has worked in vision and language, uh, you need high capacity architectures like transformers. Um, we also, to an extent, although not fully, understand their scaling behaviors. Like they scale with a lot of params with compute and also with a large data set size. We also know that data set, uh, the size uh, matters more than quality. This is like the rise of weekly supervised learning over like curated labeled data sets. The second ingredient that we could think about is like the proliferation of uh, internet scale models or foundation models as we call it. So generative models have become very popular in uh, language, in vision, uh, in audio, in other domains. And robotics is a multimodal problem. There is the camera, there is you, the natural way in which we interact with machines and with other people is via language. So I think language gives a very, language encodes a lot of information and knowledge about our world. Um, and then another important uh, part is that these models have been uh, used by a lot of different people. So a lot of data is going into it. A lot of research is going into it. A lot of capital is going into it and they are getting better and better over time. So if you really think about like 
the bitter lesson of compute. Um, if something is showing a curve of scaling exponential improvement, you probably want to hitch your bandwagon to that and then scale with it. So the question now becomes like, how do we really take advantage of foundation models in other domains to accelerate robotics? And the third is we have been seeing that robotics is slowly moving from online to offline methods. I'll give a little bit of preview on our, uh, our previous research in uh, Google Brain and why robotics has moved from online to offline. Um, and we are also seeing that in other domains like uh, language um, and image, uh, large offline data sets are the, are the way that we have been accumulating um, knowledge and uh, passing them on to like really distilling them into uh, these models. Yeah, so classically, I think since 2016, uh, everyone thought that robotics was equivalent to oral, deep oral, uh, but off late, the winds have been shifting and we are going more towards uh, supervised learning. Um, can I ask a question? Okay. Yes. So mm -hmm. when you say moving from online to offline, basically is that the is that equivalent to say pre-training with lots of yeah yeah i think uh yeah especially for reinforcement learning a lot of the methods were online in the sense that you need to collect data with a previous model and then you assume continuous improvement like it's like the q function right you continually add but uh that what it does is it couples a data generation with model capacity and we kind of with the model type, uh, like generation. And we kind of want to decouple that and just collect a lot of data and not worry about how it is collected or who collected it and just try to yeah train on all of that. Is there also an online component because RL still happens online on top of um, entry training? That, that is true. Um, we, we haven't done that yet, but we are looking into like something like RLHF on top of supervised learning. Uh, but I think for robotics, like we are right now between GPT-2 and GPT-3. So we are looking at like, how can we really get to GPT-3 before we can get to something like, I don't know, chat GPT. Maybe. Wait, do you mean scale or in terms of, or like impressiveness between GPT-2 and GPT-2 and 3? scale. Oh, okay. yeah. um, so we started working on uh, robotics at Brain uh, starting 2016. And at that time, we it was a lot about how to frame the problem of robotics as an end to end deep learning problem. Um, and it was goal conditioning, QT opt. Some of the works that came out was QT opt. It is like a sampling based reinforcement learning method. Oral cycle GAN. This is about how to learn from simulation. And our learning was like really dependent on simulation of the time and how to convert like simulation, simulated images to like look like real world images. And also how to do thinking and planning at the same time, uh, sorry, moving and planning at the same time. Then uh, between 2022 to 2023, we were maximally working on algorithms about how to solve multitask robotics. Um, and some of the work that came were BCC, AWOPT, and MTOPT. AWOPT and MTOPT are improvements over uh, QTOPT, and BCC is uh, the beginning of supervised learning. Yeah. However, we found between that time, we found that a lot of the methods sort of saturated at 50 to 70%. The promise, the bet in uh, reinforcement learning was that you have some model which is doing like 50 or 60%, and this is mostly uh, like first trained from simulation and then deployed in the real world. And then you do a lot of autonomous data collection on it as like an online method. And then you try to keep improving and try to reach up to 90. So it had that promise, but then we found that that promise did not quite materialize. Um, and yeah, and, and, and they also need specific data distributions in the sense that the new data to be collected were needed to be, the new data to train the policy needed to be collected by an old version of that policy. And then came multitask imitation learning and it works. Uh, this was, this breakthrough we published in uh, December, 2022. Um, and this achieves 90, more than 90% on a lot of our tasks and it shows very good promise of scaling. 
So the main takeaway in robotics from the last six years is that it has moved, uh, like st state of the art methods have moved a lot from online to offline. And we decoupled generation from consumption. So now just to summarize the three ingredients that we talked about, one is design principles of ML scaling. So high capacity architectures, interoperability, so like tokenizing everything to like fit into different types of models. Um, then how to use foundation models and using language as a glue between robotics to understand, because we, we are very good at reasoning about the world now in language. And offline uh, robot learning, like collect a ton of diverse uh, data uh, offline and then um, try to do pre-training with it, try to scale that data collect. So based on these three ingredients, the recipe then becomes collect a lot of large diverse offline data, then use high capacity architectures like transformers, and then try to use language as a connective tissue between them to reason about uh, things. So now let's look at like how we can, how we have been applying uh, these principles and what are the recent breakthroughs uh, as a result. Any questions? Okay, Maybe one question, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, if you talk about large diverse data sets, um, this is still like single robot, right? Not um, different robot versions or different instantiations of robots, right? Like no um, quadruped or like different morphologies in that sense. Yeah. Uh, so there are some efforts which RT1, uh, which I'm going to explain, uh, does a little bit of data mixing from different robots. But uh, I think Earlier, uh, we didn't have methods that showed very promising uh, cross embodiment transfer, uh, but now we are beginning to see and now we are also sort of pushing in that direction to um, share data between different robots, because the action spaces are very different and that was that was one of the hurdles. Um, question? Yeah. Um, when I look at this from an outsider, it looks a little bit like trying to train a large language model by like collecting a whole bunch of diverse supervised data sets. And it feels like there's sort of a missing, like what would be the equivalent of like next token prediction uh, for like an embodied system? It feels like that piece is kind of missing. Um, yeah, I'll talk about that in a subsequent slide. So um, I wanna talk about Robotics Transformer 1. And one of the focuses in robotics is that we want models to be robust and generalized. Robustness means that uh, a little bit of difference in how the environment is set up uh, should not cause the model to break. Um, and generalization means that um, it can generalize over different domains. So like you change background, you change lighting, you go to new environments and the model doesn't break still. So we tried to use existing our existing demonstration data set, uh, which was collected on 13 robots, 17, over 17 months and 700 different physical tasks. And one of the problem with collecting new robotic data is that autonomous collect is costly and it's very engineering heavy. And human teleoperation is also kind of costly because humans only scale linearly um, at best. Um, and we also have some idea based on BCC, what kind of models work sort of well. And then can we use that as inspiration to design a new architecture? So one, another design constraint is that um, off the shelf models are too slow. So scaling and inference are competing goals in some, some way, because as you scale the models, they become slower to do inference, but if you're doing robotics, you need to run multiple inferences per second uh, because the world is very dynamic. And if you're too slow, that's not good enough. So you have a preference towards like smaller models or other compression schemes. And the way our data is structured, it's very language conditioned. So you say something like, uh, pick up a Coke can or bring me a drink, uh, where you input a text instruction and then and you have the camera image and everything and you want to output actions. So we kind of uh, embarked on creating a new architecture with attention and tokenization. So this is RT1. And the main design principle here is that we 
uh, take a langu language instruction, like pick rice chips from top drawer and place on counter. And then we also use image history of, uh, in the specific paper, it was like six, um, of last six timestamps. And then we pass it through a film conditioned efficient net. So efficient nets are faster uh, than rest nets and film, uh, and they are pre-trained efficient nets. So they bring in some amount of generalized knowledge that efficient net was trained on. I think it was trained on image net. And then we also use film fusion to do early combination of language and image. Then we pass it through a token learner. Um, so it's tokenized input and output. We pass it through a token learner. And what token learner does is it does a compression of the image tokens. So uh, without using token learner and the compression, the inference speed of RT1 is around one, uh, one hertz. And with using token learner, it's three hertz. Uh, Token learner decides what adaptively decides at each inference step, which tokens are the most important and just picks those. Um, this is a decoder only transformer. And the output here is like, it's 11 tokens and they correspond to whether to terminate the episode or not, control the arm or not, control the base or not. And for each, for the arm control, there is the indefector position and uh, rotation. There is also, um, and for base, there is uh, the base velocity and angle. Um, and we use a pre-trained efficient net as an image tokenizer, and we use token learner for faster compression, as I explained. So the main takeaways from the design of RT1 is that the inference budget uh, is pretty important. Um, in order to run at three hertz, we need to do inference at 100 milliseconds because th there's also the rest of the stack with like all the robot control code and everything and acting, the state delay from capturing the camera image. So I think robotics in a little bit is also a system problem uh, compared to um, I think language, uh, language generation. Um, and then we also, we use some amount of history is important and a little bit of ablation showed us that six was the optimal number. Um, at least for the task that we collected. Uh, it, it also depends a little bit on the task behavior. Um, token learner is important to subsample the to uh, most important tokens out of an image from 81 to eight. Um, we discretize actions into 256 bins um, and the model that we ran was 35 M parameters. So it's nowhere near as big as uh, the biggest uh, language models and stuff. And in, in this case, we did the trade-off for uh, faster inference, but we have a few models in a few work now that is really looking at like, how can we actually scale to like the scale of billions of parameters. And we see that RT1 has a very good performance uh, compared to uh, compared to previous baselines. One of the baselines we compared was DeepMind Scatter. Uh, 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 we also compared against uh, BCC, which was a previous baseline, and a bigger BCC network, which matched the size. And we see that, so seen tasks is the 700 tasks that RT1 was trained on. Unseen tasks is, uh, you. so each task is of the type, there's a verb and there's an object. So we combine the verb and the object um, in a novel way, but that specific combination has not been seen before. And RT1 also does well on unseen tasks. Then we add more distractors in the background. So let me, yeah, this is an image of like more distractors. Um, and also we try different backgrounds. So like different Google kitchens to see how it works. And it, it's actually a pretty good baseline because we spent, this was, this came out in December and we spent January and the RSS deadline, RSS ICML deadline, trying to break it to, improve on it and uh, it was actually pretty hard to break it and we really had to like explore for scenarios where or expand capabilities to uh, improve over RT1. And RT1 we, we also tested on different types of generalization. Let me give you a few examples of the
So I'll let you to watch the video since I'm short on time. And uh, to answer the question uh, that I think uh, someone asked before, which was on uh, trying different types of either robot data sets or simulation data sets. We really tried to push RT1 to its limit. First, we tried just adding data from SIM and uh, trying to see how well it, uh, it works. And we realized that adding, adding, it is able to absorb SIM data and adding simulation data improves both seen as well as unseen uh, tasks a little bit. And it mostly works for pick skills. It's very hard to learn uh, different action primitives in simulation, but it's easier to like uh, learn new object types in simulation. Uh, one of my, like the result that I really like the most from the RT1 paper is uh, when we tried to mix uh, KUKA, which was a robot that we used to have, it no longer exists. Uh, we tried to mix KUKA data with it. Um, and initially what we did was we just tried to train the input of KUKA and the output of KUKA with uh, RT1's body. So sort of like just give all the data and then see if the new robot, which has never seen the old robot or it's, uh, uh, or knows about its embodiment to predict the um, actions that it needs to do. Um, and this doesn't work because embodiment is pretty hard to learn um, off the shelf. But what we did later was we mixed the data of EDR and we mixed the, EDR is the robot that we use, uh, and we mixed the data of EDR and KUKA in a 50-50 ratio in the same training batch and then trained it. And we realized that uh, it was able to sort of approximate what the KUKA robot should have done uh, given the situations that it faced, even though we don't have explicit labels for the EDR robot on KUKA tasks. Um, and the reason why I found this result pretty interesting is that um, it's like robots sort of pulling their memory together. Um, and despite that EDR was not trained on a KUKA task, it was able to sort of still pick up the skills. So imagine like if I could learn the skills that my grandfather had collected data for and somehow passed the memory on to me. Um, and this is one, um, like we were very excited about the embodiment transfer here that we, we have a whole effort, which is like, now can we put like, do, like robot dogs data in it or like various different types of uh, uh, data into like one model and see, see how it works. And we have some paper coming, uh, some works coming out. So uh, stay tuned for that. Thanks. We also study about that the negative percentage when you do um, for, for both graphs. Yeah, so the negative, uh, so this means that RT1 regressed a little bit when you trained, added the KUKA data, but it's not very significant. Yeah, but also for the real, real to sim, so it looks like if you just do real tasks, it's better just to train on real data. Is that, is that what this, this means? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So adding sim makes it slightly worse, but two percent is within the noise of our evaluations. It's it's not a lot, and but we get a lot of gain in other objects. Um, but isn't real task what we want to evaluate ultimately? All of these are real evaluations. So this basically, uh, let me explain this graph. So this means that we, uh, so objects seen in SIM, um, but uh, so this means that ob we, we only train on, uh, we only evaluate on the objects seen in SIM with the skills seen in real as well. And this one means that we evaluate the objects seen in, in SIM without the skills uh, seen in real. And this is like the real with the object seen in real and the skills seen in real. So all the evaluations are actually in real. It's just the combination of skills and objects are slightly different. I see. And like, so if the way that we run evaluations is like we run the robot like multiple times and then ask it to like pick up this object and stuff. And so because our evaluations are in the real world and they take off one time, um, you cannot run a lot of evaluations for the same task. So let's say um, you run 33 evals um, and to assess performance. So 2% corresponds to like one 
a, a difference of like one failure. And that's that's not a lot. Like that's within like even if you control for like how you place objects and stuff, that's still within the noise of the evaluation. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, the two percent is like compared to real only. So basically it says if you train with real plus sim, it's all almost the same, maybe slightly worse, even though yeah. within noise. That's exactly what yeah. Yeah. Um, there's some questions from the chat. So someone's asking if RT1 is able to deal with perturbations. If that is what I meant. What kind of perturbations? So it says if someone moves the objects in the scene while the policy is rolling out, does it adapt well to these perturbations? So it does. Uh, it so if I showed the video of it picking up the green chip bag, so it attempts some types of retries. Um, I will also later show like how we have planning for large perturbations, but it is able to handle like small perturbations within the image. I see. Yeah. Um, what is the roses are red, violets are blue prefix in the instruction? Oh, uh, it just means that it can, uh, the language is via another algorithm called Sagan and it's through a language model. I will explain that in the next uh, upcoming slides. Um, so you just ask it a language instruction and you say roses are red, violets are blue, bring me a chip bag and a napkin too. And it's still able to understand that. <laughs> Where does the decomposition from top level instruction and current step instruction come from? Uh, I will show that in the next upcoming slides. All right. Um, before that, just want to explain the scaling behavior of RT1. We see that RT1 scales with data performance, uh, but the data size diversity is more important than absolute data quantity size. When we removed 25% uh, of the uh, diverse diversity of tasks, we realize that it's equivalent to just training on 50% of the data. Um, and now I want to go a little bit into high level planning. Let me check the time. Okay, I'm good. Um, yeah, so between, uh, between 2023 to 2020, uh, 2022 and 2023, we are now looking at like, how can we actually leverage foundation models? And Sagan was one of our first papers to um, uh, accomplish this. So let's think about how you give the high level instructions, right? Something like, I spilled my drink, can you help? So if you ask it to an LLM, uh, one would say, you could try using a vacuum cleaner. Another would say, do you want me to find me find a cleaner? A third would say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to spill it. And this is completely unhelpful. And this is only helpful if you have a vacuum cleaner and this may be helpful or not. So basically language models don't have any understanding of the robot's capabilities or a more grounded understanding of the what, what the world around them looks like. And robots can only do a fixed number of commands. So if it some, says something like, go get, you could try using a vacuum cleaner, but you don't know how to use a vacuum cleaner or doesn't have a vacuum cleaner, uh, that's not gonna be helpful. And uh, the second problem is they're ungrounded in the real world. So we need some way of grounding them. And so SAGAN is about grounding LLMs for robotics. So how does that work? So we ask a high level instruction and then the language model scores multiple smaller instructions. Um, uh, so it models the probability of, what is the probability of the high level instruction succeeding given that you execute a, one of the smaller uh, skills that a robot can actually do. But that's, but that's not the only important thing. Can we actually do the smaller instruction given the state of the robot? Um, and for this, we use something known as a Q function. So these are Q functions are trained uh, by uh, through reinforcement learning methods. And what they map is the probability of getting a successful reward for executing the particular task given the current state of the robot. So what we do is, so LLMs model the probability of the low level task contributing to the success of the high level task. And affordance function models the probability of the low level, low level task actually succeeding. Then you multiply the two probabilities and take the max of it. And then you do that reiteratively until uh, you get, uh, until you terminate. So let's give an example. So here the instruction is, I spilled my Coke, could you throw it away and bring me something to clean? And on the left is what the language is predicting and right is what affordance is predicting. 
So the most highly rated task is pick up the Coke can. The next thing is go to the trash can, put down the Coke can, Then it's so even so the LLM wants to terminate after that, but still pick up the sponge gets uh, more highly rated. Grab it. Yeah, so this is how you would execute like a large high level task instruction to like multiple smaller instructions that then like a control policy like RT1 can handle. And uh, so we see uh, how it performs. So it has like an 84% planning rate on uh, several of the high level uh, instructions that we tried and 74% execution rate. So this is like multiplying the planning rate with the success rate of the uh, underlying manipulation policies. It could, at the time, it could handle 101 long horizon instructions. This paper came out in April, 2022, and an upgrade to this came out um, in August, 2022. So it's much better now. Um, yeah, so the idea of SACAN is using internet scale models and uh, Google also published Palm and we tried putting uh, Palm, the 540 billion model on it. And we see that just by upgrading the underlying foundation model, the planning performance increases a lot. So this gain did not come from robotics itself, but by moving from flan to palm. We also tried like different ways of prompting, like chain of thought helps, like ask, showing it how to explain your task helps a little bit in like giving transparency into how, what the failures are. Um, we also tried better prompting methods. Um, so the regular, uh, takeaways from LLM research applies in robotics as well because we are modeling it as a language condition problem. Um, any questions here? Um, in the say can so is there like an assumption that the individual steps are sort of commutative, like that you can do them in any order and as long as you do enough of them? Uh, They're not commutative, or, right? Because and, you cannot drop a Coke can before you pick up a Coke can. I guess, or maybe put another way is, do, are, you calling, um, are you calling the language model multiple times over the course of the trajectory to get sort of the candidates or you call it once at the beginning? Um, no, multiple times. Mm -hmm. So once, once um, the manipulation model has um, finished executing because the value function also needs the camera image, right? So you need to know what the robot is, where this, what the state is right now, in order to decide what is the next task to do. Mm -hmm. And how do you know when you're done? Um, the language model tells you when you're done. Yeah. Um, yeah, but one of the problems with this is that this is like open loop, right? Like we are, we, we are not tying feedback on back to the language model. So, the, and this is like the philosophy of using language as a connective tissue for robotics. Um, so there's a lot of knowledge in the world. So world states, what the task is and task we are already sending in, but world states are something like where the apple is, where the orange is, where, where objects are, what is in the robot's hand, what is the, where the robot is. All of these are important information and they can be sort of encoded into language in order to feed it into a language model. So this is work from our colleagues. Um, that efficiently tries to use uh, this information um, in order to close the loop on the language model. So what kind of feedback exists in the scene that we can use? One type of feedback is like success detection. So you can let it, once the language model has proposed a task and the manipulation policy has, ex uh, has executed it, uh, you can have a success detector that like looks at the images and say, did I actually ex successfully execute the task or not? And then feed that information back. Um, another one is like information on like what kind of objects are in the scene. And the third type is information uh, feedback from the human. So let's say you say, go get me a Coke from the fridge. Uh, and then you go to the fridge and then uh, the language, mo the robot can be like, based on the object recognition, it'll be like, there's no Coke in your fridge. Do you, would you like something else? And then the human tells, okay, get me then a water. Um, and then it interactively replants based on that. So inner monologue is a way to like close a loop on say can to use 
uh, feedback from the environment, but in, in a language form. Um, and there's also more information in the environment, which is the uh, state of where the objects are. Um, in original Seikan, the way that it would, uh, let's say when you say find a banana, you had to like encode where the banana is, where, where the different objects are. You had to encode them in like map coordinates, but this doesn't scale, right? Like imagine you brought a robot to like my house and it's like, I, I don't wanna tell it where all the coordinates are. I want it to figure it out by itself and actually go to those objects. So how do we execute that? Uh, with, with language models and vision. And this is um, NL map. Um, this is a website here. Uh, I have it all linked in the last slide. So you can go uh, to look into detail in this uh, for each of the work. And the idea here is that before you start doing anything, do like a exhaustive scene exploration. So just go around and then you, you're basically taking a lot of images and uh, for each image, you do a region proposal, you detect what objects are in there, and you also know the uh, position of the robot when it was actually looking at those objects. Um, and then you save that. Now you build like a map that is queryable in natural language. And this is open vocabulary because you can then ask for where is the co um, and the So the bridge between the coordinates and um, the, the letter, like, uh, the text instruction of each uh, object description is uh, done using a visual language model. So here's an example. So you say recycle the coke can and uh, so the important objects are coke can and recycle bin. And because you have already uh, like uh, done a frontier exploration over the scene, you know where the coke can is and you know where the recycle bin is then you can execute go to the cocan, which is like go to that location where you saw the cocan at and go to recycle bin becomes go to the location where you saw the recycle bin at. And uh, yeah, and we still use it in like in our collect um, in running end to end SAGAN. And it's like, it usually like takes about like five to six minutes to map something, map like a reasonable floor size. I don't know what the floor dimensions are, but like, yeah, like a typical uh, office building's floor size in like six minutes, it maps everything and then you can sample different object locations. So based on inner monolog, say can inner monolog and NL map, the takeaway is that foundation models can be used to import a lot of common sense. Like things like roses are red, violets are blue, bring me a chip bag and a napkin too. Uh, that takes some, like you can't, uh, that takes some common sense to understand what the user is actually asking for and how to uh, dissect that into smaller low level instructions. And we are offloading that work to language models because they're becoming smarter of late. Um, yeah, so uh, back in 2018, uh, nobody thought we would be using language models for semantic planning and now we are. And language is a very uh, universal way to like communicate between like world world states, robot states, task instruction, um, and you can reason uh, with common sense and you can bring in a lot of knowledge about the world um, that you, you don't have to like essentially uh, specifically program for. Um, and I also wanna talk about like one of our recent works, uh, this just came out yesterday. Um, it's called, uh, um, I'll talk about it, it's called Moo. Uh, and uh, the idea here is that uh, we use visual language models to generalize, to improve manipulation policies themselves. So um, there are two axes for generalization. Um, if, you, uh, if you look at the task that I, uh, the framework that I proposed, uh, you have you usually have a verb and you usually also have objects. So one axis of generalization is to just do more more verbs and to get capable at doing like let's say opening doors, placing, squeezing, or, or a lot of these words, and to also handle different types of objects. Um, and the thing is that visual language models encode a lot of information about the world and they can detect a lot of objects zero shot. And they have been getting really good over the last few years. So can we use uh, the generic knowledge, uh, the zero shot detection capabilities of visual language models in order to improve 
um, manipulation policies on unseen data, uh, on unseen objects. Um, and this is an example of like how it works. Uh, it, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the architecture, but we were successful in doing, uh, in sort of uh, extending to newer objects without explicitly collecting a lot of da data for these objects. Um, for RT1, it took about thousands of demonstrations in order to get good on, like hundreds of demonstrations to get good on one object, but that's a very costly way and you cannot scale like that for each object in the world. Um, so, so, you, so this really helps like zero shotting uh, to newer objects. And the way that we do this is you use the same RT1 framework uh, but before you start the episode, you run object detection, and then you detect where uh, what where the objects are, what are the objects in the scene, and then you once you know the task instruction, you pass a mask in uh, to along with the image, and then uh, and then you just regularly you run RT one as usual. So the only difference here is the mask, which is provided by a, a, a visual language model, and here we use. Um, a version of VIT. And these are the different types of, so RT1 was trained only on 17 objects uh, because at the time we wanted to focus a lot on skills. Um, and then we then trained, we collected a little bit data on a lot of different types of objects. And then we tested this on uh, a variety of object types. Like we would go around the office looking for newer object types that robots cannot handle and then try to put it in there and see like what it can do. And the, well, the common sense argument that we used here was that um, it's very hard to generalize from 17 objects to the 101st object. But if you have a lot of data on 17 objects and just a little bit of data on let's say 100 objects, then it gets easier to extend to 101st objects. And that, that was the idea here. So the, the, the green, the orange here is RT1's data. And then we collected a little bit of data on like newer objects. And then we did also on CME And we see a lot of we see a lot of improvement over RT1 uh, with uh, with Moo. Uh, the main thing is that it gets much better on unseen objects, but it also gets better on seen objects. Um, because the VLM is uh, generalizing with objects, it's harder, you, you don't really learn new skills because action primitives are still something that foundation models yet don't have. Um, so we are scaling with like image on the axis of image and language. And you also get a lot of bonus uh, generalization, which is like, because the VLM is good at uh, ignoring backgrounds and stuff, your manipulation policy uh, just gets those skills for free. Uh, there are some limitations still. Um, you, while you do uh, generalize to a few out of domain objects, um, you don't generalize to like something that's like widely different. Um, for example, we were like surprised that like it could pick up like spoons and stuff. Spoons are like really small objects that like it's pretty hard with the dexterity of the robot to like really pick them up. But new, learning new actions is still very hard. Um, and the main takeaway from here is that uh, you do offline robot learning. So you are basically collecting a little bit of data and then not worrying about how they're collected. And you also leverage foundation models to bring internet scale priors into your policies. And some label noise is fine when your data set is large. Um, so now, now that we know what are the main ingredients and what are the takeaways from recent uh, papers, um, how do we go about now really, really scaling them? So I discussed this slide before. The idea here is that we need to build a large offline data set and really pump the data into uh, maybe a large transformer with language as a uh, universal glue between them. And for skill learning, we can use RT1 or something like, or maybe the next generation version of it um, that we are working on, uh, so stay tuned. Uh, and for planning, for higher level planning between high level instruction and low level primitives, you can use something like SACAN, inner monologue for closing the loop on it. For low level control, uh, this is another paper from our group called Code as Policies. The idea here is that the language model generates code for uh, doing low level tasks um, and 
while they're not highly accurate, we can still use them as autonomous policies to collect a lot of data that then we can like screen through uh, the final learning model that we are training. Then there are also some data augmentation work that I don't, I didn't get the time to discuss here. But the main idea here is that we use VLMs for success detection, and we use diffusion models to imagine experiences uh, on top of what we already collect for, in order for greater generalization. And we use object-centric representations. So NLMAP for object-aware navigation, and uh, MOVE for object-aware manipulation. Uh, yeah, open, open world manipulation. Now, the, in order to build the foundation model, the key would be to, um, so this is like a funnel, uh, try a lot of data that was collected by all of these previous policies, pump it into RT1, and then using the foundation model aware methods, collect more data, and then keep pumping and build uh, skills. There are still a lot of research directions uh, that we need to make development on. Uh, the bottleneck is still on skill learning. And the reason here is that action, if you think of robotics as a multimodal between language, action, and vision, uh, language and vision, we have a lot of data for, but action is still, we are still lacking on data because you have to collect them on robots. And this is because like transfer from human embodiment is, oops, transfer from human embodiment is not solved yet. Um, and we, we have some, uh, we have some people who are investigating into that, if, if it works, then we would be able to train on like YouTube scale human manipulation data. Uh, but right now we don't see that transfer. And then the idea is how do we um, really use the bitter lesson? How do we do data-driven methods with foundation models to expand robotics? And how do we also scale our collect in order to collect more and more data? One of the takeaways from RT1 in December is that it shows no limit of scaling. You put more data into it, it is able to absorb with like, as you size up the model and it learns. Um, so can we really push it to its limit by like really dumping it with a lot, a lot of diverse action data and can we collect that data highly autonomously? We'll see. Um, thank you for listening to the talk. Uh, these are the links for the, each of the projects have their own websites. So you can go look in there for more details. Um, any questions? I have one question. Um, when you're trying to extend uh, your Moo model to uh, multiple objects, do you, is there any kind of uh, prompt you put in there, like to describe the object, the new object, like small, convex, fragile, uh, things that it could maybe abstract eventually to generalize the fact that when you go to pick up that bag of chips, you shouldn't crush it? Yeah, we actually had to. Uh... So it's not very dexterity aware right now, but we did do some prompt tuning between um, our objects to what is understandable by the VLM. For example, you say in, in, in common speak, you say the Sprite bottle or the Coke can or like XYZ brand chip bag, but a, lang but a VLM doesn't understand that. So you have to sort of translate that into like brown chip bag. Uh, it's it's more sensitive to like if you describe objects in terms of like colors rather than it doesn't have understanding of brands. Um, that that was one kind of tuning we did, not so much for like fragility um, right now, but maybe it's important in the future. Yeah. Any other question? So yeah, Krikthana, great talk. Um, I had one question. So if you were to augment more uh, from VLM to another modalities, which modalities would you say would be the most effective or most helpful in, in, in increasing the accuracy of the model? So action is the modality where we lack data on, uh, which is like basically how to do a new task. Like, for example, if you look at like how you pick objects, like a lot of them are fairly reasonable, right? You approach, you grab, and then you lift. Uh, but things like squeeze, um, things like open things, it's very hard for that data to like naturally come by, especially with the robot's embodiment. So I would say that is where we lack the most data and that is where we should focus our efforts in collecting. Uh, 
Oh, hi. Uh, in relation to that question, uh, I think at the last slide, I think you talked about human embodiment. Could you could you expand that just a little bit? How that uh, corresponds to the actions? Uh, yeah. I I'm not really familiar with the language. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, we have a lot of, uh, in YouTube, you have a lot of data of humans doing things, right? We have NBA basketball videos about like how to play basketball at like superstar level. We have, we have a lot of cooking recipe videos. Ideally, we can just put all of that in a robot and get the robot to like start making an omelet by watching a video of you making an omelet. This is how I make omelets or learn how to do new things. But because I can easily uh, map the transfer between my body and uh, the videos. Um, it's the transfer between robots looking at human videos and executing on their own um, hands is not solved yet. Uh, I feel like that would be an important piece to unlock in the bigger puzzle of things. Yeah. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, do you have also experimented with uh, different type of uh, uh, grippers here? Uh, so that maybe that also affects the how the your uh, objects are being picked up? Um, it does. It does matter. Uh, we haven't done a lot of experimentation with different types of grippers, but we are looking into cross embodiment transfer now and uh, also trying to see if we can run on. We're not now constrained by the robot software. We're constrained by robot hardware. So we are definitely exploring in like, can we have two arms? Can we uh, do more complex dexterous manipulation tasks? Um, so maybe in the future, not right now. Cool, thanks. Uh, from the chat, for the action gap, are there any games or other simulation environments that can leverage humans playing as robots, or is this obvious and already has been done? There are some simulation environments uh, that do have, uh, so we, we also have EDR simulation. It's useful. It doesn't, there is always a sim to real gap uh, that, in addition to the action gap, there is a sim to real gap uh, that doesn't help us actively learn from um, simulated actions. Also, it's very, it's harder to simulate actions. Um, the easier way I think would be to uh, do like these primitives, which is like basically break down even something like grab an object to like lower primitives, like um, approach, close your gripper and then lift. And then use code as policies to generate code for that and then collect with that and then feed that into a bigger model. Those are methods that we are look, uh, exploring, um, but not, not, not a lot from like simulation environments. Um, I have a, just a simple clarifying question. All right, right here, I see affordance. Can you just kind of clarify what that means? I've I've seen this term before in a different context. I don't know if it is the same context or not. But it's the probability of getting a reward uh, given that you are in the current state. Okay. All right, and then another simple question, like, uh, so. What's, I don't know if this is the right terminology, the right jargon, but uh, kind of piggyback, piggybacking off that. So what would be a failure mode for this? Uh, say, like, suppose it can't do it, or I don't know, the end result is that it doesn't know what to do, or the probabilities just aren't there for it to take any action. What's the fit? Like, what's, what it, is this system capable of asking a clarifying question? So inner monologue is, for example, um, when you don't see an apple in the scene, you can say that pick up an apple is infeasible. Or if you are very bad at picking up things, then you probably don't want to attempt to do that. So inner monologue is able to relay that information back to the user. Original SACAN is not. Um, we are also looking into now that you have that information that you're either the object is not there or you're incapable of doing that task or you have attempted it and still failed. Um, can you 
maybe ask for a remote human for help. Um, I, my personal belief is that deploying um, robotics in the wild, at least um, would, at least in the beginning, would involve a lot of human intervention, and we would not be able to like rely on 100% autonomy. So if you look at self-driving cars, they have a human seamlessly coming in and helping the car solve problems when like let's say it's off the map and stuff. And it's so seamless, the integration is so seamless that you don't, the person who's driving in the car doesn't even notice. And we need those methods to like really solve like hard cases. Um, so the, like, so then, but then the LLM would have to, like the robot brain would have to understand how to reason, when to ask for help. Uh, these are some problems that we are looking into. Hopefully uh, we have more news uh, to share on that in the future. Okay. Thank you. Uh I, it's not, I think I have a small question on the online fine tuning part. Uh, mm -hmm. So how does it help? Can it help in like getting better task generalization? And I think you have covered mostly in some of the topics like you use diffusion models to like imagine what things in the future. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering like uh, whether we can use like uh, good reasoning capabilities from language models and try to combine it with like online fine tuning. Or I mean, what are your thoughts on that like in general? Um, right. Yeah, this is also another avenue we are exploring. So basically using language models to generate what to collect for and what data to add to your fine tuning data set. So basically things like assume that I'm, I'm very bad at doing a particular skill, then I want to collect more and more of that skill. And I also want my collect to be sort of explorative. So um, in RT1, we decided, we humans decided what the data needed to be collected was. But um, in the next gen, we want uh, language models to decide what data to collect on, and also RT1 to give that feedback to say where I do badly, um, go collect more data on that. So we we are looking a little bit into these methods. Um, hopefully, we have some updates to share this year. So do you think like this is one of the like short to solving the action generation part, which you kind of try to cover? Um, I doubt it. Uh, depends on how you collect that data, right? Because they want, let's say RT1 knows where to collect. RT1 and the robot uh, and LLM knows what to collect data on. They're still not good at actually collecting data on that task because RT1 cannot do it and LLM doesn't do action. Yeah. So you either need to ask a human uh, teleoperator for help, and humans only humans don't scale exponentially, or you need to build a good autonomous policies that can zero shot to a new task. Um, one way would be like code as policies with VLM, where, like I said before, you break down a high level task and you reason about how to collect for it. And then you like attempt fail, but then feed the successes back into your training. Um, it's harder to do, but we, we'll see how, how successful that effort is. We are, we are attempting those methods right now. Or like leveraging data from like video observations is like maybe the very good bullet to solve it. Thank, thanks a lot. Yeah, like VLM in the loop, active predict for collect. Yeah, thanks a lot. So five minutes over, maybe one or two final questions. I had like a down the road question. Um, do you think like, you know, when this uh, robot learning becomes more general, like it's possible that the biases from like the language model um, could like impact the actual actions of the robot. Um, can you repeat that? What do you mean by lang language model is already impacting, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, but like right now, um, there's a like a skill gap, right? When um, for the robot, like it needs to see more different examples that are diverse. Like, so I'm just saying like, like further on when it gets to the point where it becomes like more diverse and stuff, like maybe the biases in the language model, like because it's trained on text and the internet could mm -hmm. possibly make the robot um, do something that is harmful. Do you see that being a problem or not really? Oh yeah, we do see that being a problem, right? Because if language model generates a plan, like pick up a knife, uh, bring it to you, put it in you, the robot will actually do it right now. So we need, yeah, I think alignment, safety work that is being fed into language model is also very important. Right right now we are doing collect policies and sometimes like I'm sitting in the kitchen and then it like it says, I see a woman sitting near a table and then it also proposes what has to collect for. So it's very important um, for everyone's safety that uh, that language model is also. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
because they, we are using them to reason. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the biases kind of accumulate, I guess. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks. Is that why um, robotics research are mostly in research and not quite deployed yet? Like the safety concerns are not very well addressed. I think it's more that, I mean, there's a lot of robotics deployed, but they are not generally intelligent robots. So it's solving, I, it's solving general intelligence that is the most important thing. But in robotics, like safety and solving intelligence is very close together. Because in language model research, like if the LLM is wrong, it just says bullshit or gaslights you like Sydney thing. But in the in in robotics, if it's wrong, it breaks things, it falls down, it injures people or babies. So for us, safety is more really tied into uh, how it works. Yeah. Maybe we will stop here. Sure. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share my excitement about robotics and our recent work. I am really pumped in solving this problem and hope, uh, I think a lot of machine learning people don't quite understand uh, what where robotics research is or what are the pain points. So um, I'm hoping that more of you are interested in robotics and have the exposure for it. Yeah, and it looks like a new trend just started. So if you wanna do robotics right now, is the right time to join. Just yeah. like machine models, like large scale training plus language. Yeah, still a lot of exciting problems here. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.